We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. Tonight, we're, our question comes from Candice, who went over to the website and clicked on Ask the Bellhop with this question. My boyfriend went to work overseas for a year. I'm looking for challenging, single-player, fantasy-themed games to play until he returns. Any suggestions? Thank you so much for your help. Oh, thanks so much for the great question, Candice. Uh, this just happens to be a question we just received recently that I wanted to bump up to the top of the pile due to being somewhat time sensitive. Like It's not going to be worth answering this if Candace's boyfriend is already back. Plus, it's not a topic we ever discussed before, and I think there's some great game suggestions for this particular topic. Now, while the bellhop has said in the past for a, the, a solo game, he generally goes to the PlayStation, <laughs> we're not completely without solutions to this problem. So lately it's become the switch, but still something digital. If I can't play with a bunch of people at my table, I'd rather go play something digital, but in general. So before I start diving into the game recommendations, I want to actually kind of break up Candace's question. It's not a long question, but there's actually a lot in there. There's a lot to unpack. So I want to highlight some of that before we get to it. So the first thing that Candace mentions is that they're looking for challenging games. This means to me, some games with some weight to them games that aren't light and quick, and games that may be difficult to win. This immediately knocks out some of my personal favorite solo games like Friday and Owner Rim. Now, I don't actually know how much gaming experience Candice has, but I'm going to assume they're not scared of heavier games while making this list. As always, heavy is a concept more than a number and mm -hmm. will vary widely for all involved. Now, the next part is, of course, single-player games. That's pretty simple, to, to not a lot to break down here. I think limiting this games to lists that only play one player, though, would lead me to an empty list. I, I There aren't, as far as I know, like, unless, again, unless you count Owner Rim, any single-player only fantasy games, uh, board games at least, that would be on this list. So what I will be doing is suggesting games that can be played solo, but are actually designed for more players than that. And, well, yes, there are a ton of solo-only games out there. We haven't finished narrowing down the list from the question yet. <laughs> yeah, so that's the, the next part, the theme. Candace is looking for fantasy-themed games. Now, without clarification, this could mean a number of things, but we're going to, um, I think we're safe to assume this means, you know, heroic, magical fantasy, elves and dragons, and not, say, horror or urban fantasy. Now, just in case we're wrong, I'm going to make sure to mention some less swords and sorcery fantasy games in the honorable mentions tonight. So we're going to break those from the main list. The main list is going to be your D&D &D traditional fantasy games. And if you mean surrealist fantasy, drop us a note and we can work on that too. Dolly would be proud. Yeah, I'm not sure if there's a solo version of Dixit out there. There isn't one that I've seen, but that definitely would get into the surrealist level. Now the last bit that is easy to overlook is the, the quote, until he returns. This is important. Candace noted her boyfriend would be gone for a year. So that either means she wants lots of different games to play over that time, or possibly, and I think more likely, she wants some truly epic games that are going to take up a large chunk of that time or even the entire time. And thankfully, I've got recommendations for lots of games or just one or two big long ones. And I bet you when I talk about one or two long solo fantasy games, you probably know which ones I'm talking about. And since we're focusing on games that aren't exclusively solo, you can still introduce your partner to them when they do return mm -hmm. and have date night gaming. Now, as usual, this list is in no particular order, and make sure you stick around for a few honorable mentions at the end. All right, number one, a game that fits absolutely everything about Candace's question so perfectly that we could stop the list right here and just name one game and be done for the entire night. And that is Gloomhaven. Although I would rather say the Gloomhaven series of games, starting with Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Because now that Jaws of the Lion exists and I have played Jaws and I have played Gloomhaven, I strongly suggest anyone looking into get into this game series, start there. Jaws of the Lion is a fantastic onboarding tool for learning how to play Gloomhaven, as well as giving you a chance to try it out and decide if it's right for you before dropping over a hundred bucks on the big box. Now, I've always noted on the podcast before, Gloomhaven is not always what people expect. 
It is a rather heavy and complex resource management game where those resources are not just your hit points, it's also the cards in your hand. This is not a fantasy sword and sorcery dice checker dungeon crawler. It's challenging. And there is more than enough game here that it could literally keep someone busy for an entire year. Now, regarding playing solo, there are a large number of gamers out there that think Gloomhaven is best when played solo. So strongly recommended at solo, enough gameplay to keep you busy for a year. Again, start with Jaws just to see, because it's a good, good way for one to learn the game. And second, to see if you do dig Gloomhaven, because it may not be the fantasy you're quite looking for. No, well, there is a specific solo-only expansion out there for Gloomhaven. Mm -hmm. It's only playable once the city has reached, reached level two with two retired characters and characters participating being level five or higher. So it's not something you run out and get at the start of your Gloomhaven adventures because you want to play solo. Yeah, and I own this, okay? So it's not really a solo expansion. It's not even a solo campaign. What it is is it's a book with one solo scenario for each character that can be unlocked in the game. And what you do is, if you finish the solo campaign, the solo scenario, just one scenario, usually three rooms, you get a unique item. And what this is actually meant for is to supplement your existing campaign. It's a way to level up your characters in the middle of an existing campaign. You can't just play the solo expansion on its own. It's like a side quest. And that was Gloomhaven. Next, I have Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. This is a big box Middle-Earth-themed fantasy game that is a progression that started with the Descent board game from Fantasy Flight and evolved into Descent 2 Imperial Assault with Middle-Earth, uh, sorry, Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth being the, the culmination of that series of games so far. Now, you take on heroes in Middle-Earth, but not the named heroes you would, would expect. There's, you're not playing the Fellowship of the Ring. You are playing elves and hobbits and humans, but you're not playing, you know, the, the fellowship or the main characters. Now, each game you play is standalone, but it is a single adventure in a long campaign. Now, it is 100% app driven. You cannot play this game without an app, and it's that app that lets it work as a solo play experience. Now, while I do have this, we even have an unboxing video out there. I haven't had a chance to sit down and play it myself. But based on what other people have said, board game geek information, what it said in the rules, each game should be pretty epic, taking about two hours. But I'm not sure how long the overall campaign is. Now, being a fantasy flight game, there are also, of course, expansions to help keep the game fresh and interesting. Now, I'm certain you're not going to get as much playtime in this as you would from, say, Gloomhaven. But this does offer some replayability because the app does randomize things out of what you own. So you can play through the campaign a second time or a third time, and it will be different from the first. Now, this one's big enough or important enough or caught enough people's attention that it won the 2019 Golden Geek Best Solo Game. Now, again, that's Best Solo Game by Alpha Gamers, people who have taken the time to register and join Board Game Geek, voting this Best Solo Game. So you got to take that as a strong recommendation. Like I'd rather that than a Dr. Toy Award, for example, when I'm looking for a more complex game. And you get the benefit of a more familiar world to play in, if that's your preference, compared to Gloomhaven, which is its own unique universe. Mm -hmm. And that was Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth. Now, another Middle-Earth-themed game popped up on a number of best solo game lists. Now, this is another one I haven't personally tried. As I said, I am not a big solo gamer, so I haven't rushed out to try all these. And that is The Lord of the Rings, the card game. So this is a non-collectible card game from Fantasy Flight that many say is the best with one player. Now, this is old. This is very old. This was literally the first living card game. It was the first game to ever trademark LCG. And because of how old it is, the big problem with this game is it's long out of print. Being the first living card game also means they had some things they hadn't quite ironed out. So now with this being out of print could mean one of two things, which is why I wanted to include it on the list, is you may be able to find it cheap. I know various expansions are dirt cheap because I have been sharing them on tabletop deals quite often. The base game, though, I have no clue. Now, it may mean you won't be able to find this anywhere. 
or more importantly, you might be able to find the base game, but none of the expansions, which are kind of needed to keep it fresh. So this one's kind of a grain of salt recommendation. It sounds cool. We've got people in our chat room right now talking about how freaking good it is. So it's definitely a, a popular idea out there, but I'm not sure if you will find it. This is ranked number five in customizable card games on Board Game Geek. Top five. Now, we have never claimed to be at the <laughs> forefront of new hotness, nope. and we stand by that. So that was The Lord of the Rings, the card game. Next, I have Mage Knight, the board game. Now, I'm still completely baffled how a cheap alternative to Warhammer that featured really cheaply pre-painted plastic miniatures and collectible elements, and it was a big war game where you're measuring tapes, got turned into the epic fantasy adventure in a box that's actually a deck builder. Like, I, I don't know what this Mage Knight has to do with the old one. Thankfully, nowadays, I think most people have forgotten the old miniature game and everyone only knows this. So it's good. Mage Knight is fantastic. Now, similar to Gloomhaven, there's quite a bit of learning curve in this game. This is not an easy game to learn. Um, there is a tutorial in the rule book that's going to take you like three hours to play through. And even then, you're going to be looking up stuff all the time. This is my personal favorite game to play solo of all time so far. Because again, I haven't played all of them. This is the kind of game you sit down and you learn to play through the tutorial. You finish that off and you set up a game and you just leave it somewhere set up. You then go do whatever you cook dinner, you do what you're doing. And then you're like, ah, and then I'm going to go over and I'm going to play a couple turns. I'm going to move a couple hex. I'm going to explore a new territory. I'm going to go to this shop and go shopping. Then you lead it, go. And then you come back again, some other time. Now, Mage Knight hits all the fantasy tropes. You're going to build a character. You're going to improve that character. You're exploring the land. You're going to run into monsters. The monsters have layers. There's wizard towers, cities with shopping and more. If there was no Gloomhaven, this would have been my biggest recommendation of the night. Now, Mage Knight is also infinitely replayable due to most of the game being generated randomly as you play. There are also a number of set scenarios you can try and lots of fan content and a new edition that was just released that combines all the existing content into one box. So just to, uh, to sort of put it into perspective, while Gloomhaven is still on BGG, the number one game in all of its categories, Mage Knight sits at a very hefty 25 for strategy and 26 overall. That's nice that they're that close. <laughs> and that was Mage Knight. All right, next, I wanted to kind of broaden our horizons because many of the games I mentioned kind of have similar themes and similar kind of style of epic battles and that. So I wanted to throw something different in here, and that is Legends of Andor from Cosmos. Now, this is a fantasy-themed cooperative game that looks like it's going to be this dice-chucking fantasy overland romp with lots of dice rolls and sword swinging, but it's actually more of a puzzle-style game where you're trying to optimize your moves and figure out the right order to complete various steps in your quest to be able to complete it. Now, I will say this one is much better with more players. Part of the fun is the negotiating and trying to figure out the puzzles together, and you go take care of that over there while I take care of this over here. It can be played solo. Now, the downfall with Andor is if you're looking to get a year's worth of gameplay out of it, you're going to have to pick up the expansions. There are many. Now, Technically, you can replay through the campaign once you've solved each puzzle, but I've got to say they're not as much fun playing through multiple times. Now, that said, the story is good and the game is engaging, and it does have a lot of dice rolling. So it's not like it is a puzzle, and it's not like playing an escape room game where there's one answer. It, it's more of a, okay, we figured out we definitely need to stop the guys coming in from over here. Well, someone else has to go over here to grab that. Whereas the next time you play the dice go differently, you're like, oh, you know what? The right, right side's perfectly fine. We need to defend this out. So it's it's not a one solution puzzle, but to me, it always felt more like a, a multiplayer puzzle to solve rather than a big epic adventure. Well, puzzles are not everyone's cup of tea, however. So it's just one of the many options we have out there. That was Legends of Andor. Next, we're going to get into a literal dungeon crawling game all about exploring dungeons with lots of miniatures for heroes and bad guys, and that is Sword and Sorcery. Uh, this is generic fantasy themed. Like, the name is even generic fantasy themed. It's everything you'd expect from a Sword and Sorcery game. 
Uh, this is a cooperative game where you're facing off against the game itself using an in-game AI, so similar to Gloomhaven, no app like Lord of the Rings. Now, this is a miniature heavy game, which, you know what, if you got a year, maybe you want to pick up miniature painting as well to fill in time between games. Now, this one does come strongly recommended as best with two or one. Now, box, the core box, contains one of a three-part adventure, and this is one of those ones where you look it up on Board Game Geek, and the list of stuff for this game just keeps going. Now, what I will say is this is much lighter than Gloomhaven. This is more of your fun fantasy romp, uh, lower on the challenging level and the complexity sale. And this is the game I see a lot of people when they're like, ooh, Gloomhaven was too much for me. People are like, oh, try Swords and Wizardry. And then they fall in love with that. So it's a step down on that complexity scale, a little less Euro and a little bit more adventure game, more from the Euro side to the Emirates trash side, as we've talked about before. So as we recently mentioned, miniature painting is its own hobby and not one to be entered into lightly, as it will suck up your time, your money, and possibly your sanity, judging by some of the <laughs> painters I met. However, some of them may have started before ventilation was as important as it is now. <laughs> but that was Swords and Sorcery. All right, well, I'm certain it won't be enough to keep you busy for a year. I have heard fantastic things about Legacy of Dragonhold from Fantasy Flight Games, with almost everyone who's reviewed this game saying this isn't a multiplayer experience. They forced in multiplayer rules. This is something you can play. It should play on your own. So strongly recommended as a solo experience. Now, this is a fantasy game set in Fantasy Flight's world of Tyranoth. Um, it's designed based on game books, like the old fantasy fighting fantasy books of old. It's a choose your own style adventure game where you do build your own unique hero who will evolve over the story. Now, there's no winner in this game, and it has a focus on playing through an engaging story. Now, the game features six different quest books to play through, which technically can be played through multiple times, trying out different characters from the six different races and the multiple character classes available. Now, I don't think this one was quite the GM-less RPG experience that was kind of sold to people on the box or that Fantasy Flight put out, but I have heard very little negative about this game. Indeed. And while not the fantasy that we've been talking about so far, in a similar vein, for people who do really crave that GM-less RPG experience, I've heard fantastic things about Thousand-Year-Old Vampire. Okay. Uh, so not as mainstream as Legacy of Dragonhold, but uh, I've heard some great things on, in that GM-less RPG experience. Choose your own adventure vein. But this See, I was, think the, oh, I think the difference there is Thousand Year Old Vampire is an RPG experience, whereas Dragonhold really is a which way book with your rolling dice to hit and stuff like that. It's more of a it, it's more of a board game. Now, for RPGs, I do recommend you stick around to the end of the list because we do have a fan who stepped up to give us a bunch of RPG recommendations that we'll be getting to after our honorable mentions. But that was Legacy of Dragonhold. All right, next up, a game I knew nothing about until doing research for this topic. Gloom of Killforth. Now, besides the fact they're using that Gloom name, and I'm like, do you really need to use the Gloom name with the Gloom Haven? Are you trying to cash in there? Maybe they came up with the name before that. I don't want to bash on them because, again, I don't actually know this game. This is a fantasy quest game. This came up on many people's top solo game lists. And not just fantasy solo games, but just solo game lists and is listed as best with one player on Board Game Geek. Now, what looked interesting about this is the entire game is all set in a city called The Sprawl, and you're taking part in a fantasy campaign where it's all dealing with the factions in The Sprawl and things happening on the city streets. I dig that twist from the usual dungeon crawl. Now, this fantasy game tosses out the miniatures and the dungeon tiles and the hex maps and sticks to purely using cards and a few counters for everything. Now, this looks very accessible and features some really striking artwork. I really like the look of this. Now, just to show that it does have some staying power, it was awarded the Best Solitaire Game of 2017 by the One Player Guild. And possibly the heaviest game on our list as well, just edging above Gloomhaven by like 0.01 on the weight. Wow. And that was... I gotta admit, looking at it, it didn't look that heavy but who knows? And that was Gloom of Killforth. 
that's sticking with the um high theme lots of dice thematic style games i have a number of games here actually the dungeons and dragons adventure system board games and i do have to thank bike guy dave for reminding me that these can be played solo now the first of these games was wrath of a chardelon there's also Legend of Drizzt, Castle Ravenloft, Temple of Elemental Evil, Tome of Annihilation, Waterdeep, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and coming soon, Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Now, well designed for up to five players, every single one of these games can be played solo. Now, I own the Ravenloft game from the series, and I had some fun with it. But it is very light, simple to learn, uh, some really nice looking unpainted miniatures, map tiles that I like to steal and use my RPGs. Uh, the mechanics feel like you're playing D&D, uh, specifically 4th edition, actually, with you rolling a D20 to hit and having various like daily encounter and at will abilities that you can use. AI system is really simple, but solid, like it works. There was no, there's no arguing over line of sight like you do have in some of the other games we mentioned tonight. Uh, the scenarios often featured random elements, specifically with the dungeon tiles where you draw randomly, which makes them pretty infinitely replayable. The only reason I don't push these games up like higher on the list, not that they're in any order, but like why I don't recommend these stronger is they don't fit the classification of challenging to me. I found them all pretty simple, easy to win. Um, like, yes, you had to work at it. They, were, they weren't pushovers, but they just, they were a little simpler than I personally like. So I don't recommend them stronger, but they could be the perfect game, especially if you're into the D&D theme. If you want to explore Waterdeep or check out Salt Marsh or go in the Tomb of Annihilation, this might be a great way to do it. Now, for a, I don't know, maybe more robust dungeon crawl, uh, what about Sanctum, as they did release solo rules for this at the uh, beginning of the pandemic? So I wouldn't really call Sanctum a robust dungeon crawl, uh, not because not just because there's no dungeon, so it's not really a dungeon crawl at all. Uh, it's more of a dice-chucking euro. Uh, it's all about being able to collect the right monsters that give you the best odds of rolling the right dice rolls, and then defeating them to equip the right skills and equipment so that you can modify your dice rolls more. And then it's about destroying wave after wave. There's no exploration. There's no choice on what path to go. You just follow a linear path and you move up to the next available spot. And eventually you get to a boss fight. That said, it's a solid game. I dig Sanctum. It's a fun game. But to me, it's just, it doesn't even feel like a fantasy adventure game, even though being themed on like Diablo. The problem and what had me not put it on the list is I have not heard very good things about the solo play that basically it works, but I'd rather play with friends from pretty much everyone I know who tried it. So while it's awesome, CG put out solo rules for those of us stuck at home. I don't see it as recommending it for solo play, especially over the other games on the list, though it might be worth a try, especially if you already have it. Why not try it solo? Fair enough. Now that was the D&D Adventure System games and potentially Sanctum. Now, sticking with similar games, I want to finish off the main list with something very light, very quick, and very easy. Just in case I read Candace's question totally wrong or totally misjudged their gaming experience. My final game on this list is Castle Panic. This is a tower defense game that I honestly usually recommend as a great cooperative game for kids and parents to play together. It is that light. While it's probably not going to keep anyone interested for over a year, uh, it's, it's a good, nice, fun diversion, taking well under an hour with one player. Now, there are some expansions out there to keep things interesting if you do get tired of fighting off the same monsters over and over again. And personally, I think you can never go wrong with tower defense games. But that was Castle Panic. Next, I have, I don't remember how many because I made the notes earlier today, five, maybe four or five honorable mentions. These, I will note why they're not on the main list when I get to them, but unlike our usual, it's not just games I haven't played because, well, the main list had some games I haven't played. These are mainly ones that didn't quite fit the theme or may or may not. Starting with Seventh Kanye. This is the solo game highest up on my personal wish list. While you can play up to four players, everyone I've seen talking about Seventh Continent says it's a one-player experience, maybe two. Now, like Gloomhaven, it offers an epic ongoing campaign that takes hours and hours to finish over many sessions that you can start and stop whenever you want. Now, not on the main list, because I honestly have no idea how many fantasy elements Seventh Continent has. 
Now it's set in the early 20th century where you are in a shipwreck and you're stranded on a desert island. Um, I know there are some fantastical elements to be found. And I noticed that Board Game Geek tagged it sci-fi. So I, having not played it, and I don't want to spoil it actually in a way too, because it is a kind of a discovery game. I have no clue if this qualifies as a fantasy game, but I have heard that Seventh Continent is one of the best solo experiences in board game card game form. And that was Seventh Continent. Next, something to replace the long out of print Lord of the Rings card game, and that is Arkham Horror, the card game. So again, I don't know if you consider the Cthulhu mythos to be fantasy. To me, I think it's horror. Is it a mix of both? Are your elder gods from the distant stars sci-fi? It's definitely not normal. So it's got to be fantasy of some type. So this is why this game got tossed under honorable mentions as well as the fact I haven't played it myself. But everyone I know and every podcast I've listened to has said this is one of the best solo experiences out there. That If you want a solo living card game, Arkham Horror is the way to go. Now, again, this is a non-collectible game with plenty of expansions to keep anyone busy for a year or more with new seasons still coming out. Now, again, this looks like the game that replaced Lord of the Rings for Lord of the Rings fans. Lord of the Rings, the card game fans. And that was Arkham Horror, the card game. Now, speaking of mythos-themed games, I also want to suggest Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Now, similar to Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle-Earth that made the main list, this is an app-based game. It's a cooperative game where the app plays your adversary. And what I dig about this app, and Journeys in Middle-Earth does the same thing, is you put in what expansions you own, and you'll choose and pick parts from each one to build a unique experience each time. So it'll randomize what's in the core box. You buy with just one expansion and it adds tons more replayability. Now this one I have played, I really dig Mansa Madness 2nd Edition, a real mix of exploration, puzzle solving, and dice chucking combat. I have friends who absolutely love this game, though I will admit I have not tried it solo. I have played two player and four. And that was Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. Next, I have Shadows of Brimstone. This is a big, epic, miniature, dungeon-crawling game with tons of crunch. It's almost more of an RPG with the amount of stuff going on. It reminds me of the classic games workshop game Mordheim, actually. Now, the initial premise of this game is Old West, right? You start off, you're in the Old West, you're exploring a mine, but that mine features gateways to any number of other worlds and dimensions. Each of these worlds can be explored through expansion content. They include fantasy, sci-fi, time travel, horror, and more. Now, the base game has one portal that leads you to the Plains of Targa, which is an ancient fantasy frozen city. So we got fantasy right in the core box. Now, Shadows also features a lot of random elements, including when you're trying to put out your, uh, like generate quests at the beginning of the game. So each of these settings can be explored multiple times, making the game very replayable. Now, this is another one like Swords and Wizardry that's very miniature heavy that could lead to taking part in the whole miniature painting hobby, though that's not necessarily required. Honestly, of all the games on this list tonight, this is the one I'm both most curious about and want to try and most intimidated by. There is just so much out there for this game and hearing podcasters, specifically the Secret Cabal, warning people about the level of detail and fiddliness in this game, where every time they talk about it, they're basically apologizing for it. Like, we love it, but oh, this, 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 but we love it. Like, it's just one of those games. This is the game that I think if Sean was in Windsor, we'd play together regularly and we'd be painting our own miniatures and customizing them and doing all the stuff we did with the old Games Workshop stuff. Yeah, I have to say, uh, the Shadows of Brimstone City of the Ancients, one of the three core boxes, uh, was just revised in 2020 and is currently sitting at an 8.9. Yeah, on, uh, like I said, it's it looks good. Mm. It looks really good. So that was Shadows of Brimstone and all the various 215 yes. so different uh, component you things. You can tell that game came out once Kickstarter had hit. <laughs> Finally, I want to finish off with a game from Portal Games, Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Now, this one has a theme very similar to Seventh Continent, but I think it has less fantasy elements. And to be honest, I don't know if it has any 
except for the fact it's the cursed islands. This is more of a game about surviving against the elements and local animals, keeping yourself fed, and more about that than exploring. Now, I have heard many wonderful things about this game and many people sharing great sounding moments. Like, oh, remember that time we played Robinson Crusoe and I got bit by a spider. And then it was like weeks later, we were about to get on the boat and all of a sudden my leg gave way. Like, like people tell epic stories playing this game. This one is supposed to be just as good at every player count, including one, and came up on almost every single best solo game list I saw while doing research for this topic. This is one I need to try out. I, I remember watching Big J and his best friend trying to play this at the Green Bean Cafe downtown and just being overwhelmed. But every time I asked him, how's it going? They're like, this is awesome, even though they're flipping through 100 books and trying to figure out what was going on. I really want to try this game out. Again, no clue on the fantasy elements. I, I really think it's not. It's more of a survival-based game. But it, it's called Cursed. Maybe there's some kind of voodoo curses or something in it. Well, that was Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. Well, that's it for our list of challenging solo games with fantasy themes. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now let's head over to the lobby and see if they have anything to add. I saw lots of awesome stuff going on in the chat room, and we will address that. Um, but first, I want to get to something else. So for this topic discussion and recommendations, we do mainly board game content. And so when someone sends me a question, I just default thinking about board games. We do also talk about role-playing games, and I reread Candace's question, I'm like, oh, she might have meant RPGs or she might have wanted either. So, well, many of the games we mentioned do feature RPG elements and leveling up characters. There's nothing there I would consider a full role playing game. So, after realizing this, I thought about putting in some solo RPGs. Like, I know they're a thing, I know that solo RPGs exist, but to be honest, it's a form of tabletop gaming I have not tried at all. Well, I have at least played some solo board games and I've played many of these games with multiple players so I can at least know how they play. I've never tried a solo RPG. And to be honest, I would have to do a lot of research. Like the only solo RPG I know off the top of my head is The Beast. And that's one we're not going to be talking about on this show probably ever. So that one's not going to be on this list due to the adult content in it. Well, Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron Jeff Seuss to the rescue. Jeff is our resident indie RPG fan, and mm -hmm. when we mentioned this was the topic we were going to be covering tonight, Jeff, Jeff jumped into our Discord to provide us a list of his popular solo fantasy epics RPG edition. And I just want to point out, I have not read this list until now, so it did not color any yeah. of my earlier comments. Which is why I mentioned that we were going to get to this. <laughs> First up on his list is 1,000-Year-Old Vampire. Uh, followed by Iron Sworn, probably probably the single most popular. Mm -hmm. Mythic, more mature, more popular before Iron Sworn hit the scene. A Torch in the Dark, which is a Forged in the Dark game. Quill with the White Box add-on. Mm -hmm. Scarlet Heroes. Disciples of Bone and Shadow. Delve, which is map drawing. And Terminus, Wretched and Alone Hack with an epic fantasy theme. So those are the solo RPGs that Jeff has seen people talking about the most. He did have some additional thoughts to share on some of these. Now, Iron Sworn is mentioned at least 10 times more often than any of the others. Yeah. Now, while Mythic is mentioned in a lot of archaeological Reddit threads, he hasn't seen it mentioned in solo RPG Discord land in quite a while. Sure. Now, the reason, the reason I found this earlier, Thousand Year Old Vampire is just gorgeous dripping with theme and probably doesn't fit epic fantasy, but it deserves consideration anyway as the most popular one to be purchased in fancy hardcover and flaunted rather than downloaded as a PDF. I have to say when I did hop on the website and check this out earlier during my researches, wow, is it a yeah. beautiful book. And then Wretched and Alone is a very popular system for solo role-playing and on gets mentioned often. Terminus fits the theme, but I haven't heard much about it specifically, he says. Now, for people who 
I heard that and they're like, oh, this Jeff guy sounds awesome. I want to hear more from Jeff. Jeff has actually just started a tabletop RPG TikTok channel where I can promise you he's never going to be on there louding Dungeons and Dragons. Jeff is our, as I like to call them um, affectionately, our hippie indie storytelling past the stick game uh, fan who, who's definitely into that side of gaming much more than the traditional role-playing games. So I do know he's also a fan of like Seven Seas and John Wick. So it's not all newfangled hippie shite, but he, he is into some interesting games, we will say. So I'll, I dropped a link to that. We'll throw it in the show notes as well. So there you have a number of solo RPGs that sound like they're worth checking out. So thanks so much, Jeff, for giving us these suggestions. Aren't our fans awesome? Indeed they are. And it started early in this chat yes. with Ryan uh, talking about uh, suggesting Descent 2nd Edition or the new Descent Legends in the Dark for okay. solo. 2nd Edition Descent, not popular solo. It can be done. It's done through an app and the app gets repetitive. That is what I saw in my research. I have Descent 2nd Edition. Again, I played it. I personally don't think it's, it's, it, uh, Descent 1st Edition feels dated. At this point, Descent 2nd Edition feels a little dated. I, it's still probably a solid game, but it does not come as recommended as solo. So it's playable solo, but no one seemed to recommend it that way. Now, I have no opinion on the new Descent, except, man, it looks good. It literally hit shelves this last week. Uh, Fantasy Flight is not someone we work with, so we don't tend to get previews of their stuff or anything. What I've seen of it looks great. And I have no clue. Um, I do know Tom Vassell cut it up, and a lot of people are now backing away from it, so they got some really nasty press from Tom, supposedly. But I don't even think it was nasty, but he didn't like it. And I am seeing a lot of people going, thanks, Tom, for saving me 150 bucks." So we'll see if this one even lasts. I, I don't know if it can be played solo. Like I said, it came out this week. And as we said many times in the show, we are not all about the new hotness. <laughs> Uh, it is listed as uh, one to four on BGG okay, so for, it be for what it's worth. So. For what it's worth, it says best four, but again, it just came out, so those yeah, rankings mean out. almost nothing. Uh, one thing, Razul notes early again, early on in our chat, uh, that Gloomhaven is a game that grows on you. After the first scenario, he was wasn't sure about it, but by yeah. the third, they couldn't wait for more. Oh, I did watch our original Gloomhaven stream, so it should still be out there somewhere. We lost the first scenario four times, I think, in a row and had a big debate about how is playing on easy giving up and are, are we lesser gamers for doing so? Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I still enjoyed it. But I think a lot of that, if I wasn't playing with Deanna, Tori and Kat, we might have given up on Gloomhaven or if I hadn't spent 150 or whatever I paid at the time to get that. It was definitely frustrating. Oh, we didn't start right off the bat. I didn't realize we didn't start right off the bat. Um, didn't I started. Yeah. Oh. So we we were playing a bit before our first stream. So yeah, the the, the initial experience with Gloomhaven was rough. The thing is, I knew that. I saw board game geek threads, people talking about it. Like, holy cow, how do I win this game? And the biggest trick is make sure you're following the rules because they're easy to mess up. And number two, remember you can discard cards instead of taking damage. Those are my two biggest tips for playing Gloomhaven. And if you do the first one right, the game gets much easier because people screw up stuff in those rules all the time. Uh, next up, I got a comment from Ryan. Uh, Will He would also recommend Defenders of the Realm, though it might be hard to come by now. Uh, it is a 2010 game, but it was replaced by Defenders of the Last Stand. Yeah, no one likes Defenders of the Last Stand. I don't know why. But Defenders of the Last Stand did not go over well. So is Defenders of the Realm playable solo? That one I I, I know yeah, of. Both the game. are both are playable solo. Solo. Okay. Uh, they're both they're both one to four. They're both rated as best four. Interestingly, Defenders of the uh, Last Stand has a better rating than Defenders of the Realm. Oh, that's weird. I, <laughs> I have heard no one talk about it. So Defenders of the Realm's fantasy with uh, Larry Elmore that basically uses the pandemic mechanics with boss monsters trying to come in in the middle. So some tower defense. Really interesting game. Uh, I didn't love it. That that's a best guess. I, I, it reminded me of pandemic, and everyone knows my thoughts on pandemic. It just to me, it wasn't. There was a lot of quarterbacking, which I guess solo wouldn't be a problem. Fair enough. So I did not see it come up on other people's list, but we'll definitely toss that in the show notes. Uh, going through lists here, I, I, I stopped copying things over, so I've. Uh, so yeah, the the question did want fantasy, so you wouldn't want defenders of the last stand. That's a right. that's a yeah. sci-fi. It's wasteland. 
Uh, a good uh, discussion came up about uh, co-op games in general, a little bit uh, outside of what we were talking about tonight, mm -hmm. but some good discussion about how a lot of co-op games are a little more solo than people would like. Yes. Uh, as you know, the talk of, uh, sorry, which game, uh, sorry, Lord of the Rings Living Card Game is so good because it has a lot of what uh, Pickle Help describes as their favorite camp mechanic, which is take this as opposed to take okay. that. So yep. you're helping each other out in, in actually cooperating as opposed to, uh, you know, just sort of playing along next to each other and helping each other incidentally. Yeah, no, I totally get that. I remember the, the Warhammer Fantasy role play uh, adventure card game, which I don't know if you can play solo. That I don't recommend that to anyone because there's only four scenarios and they lost the license. So it's such a dead end product. I never recommend it. But in that you had four or five cards with your actions on them. And one of them was specifically help the other players. And the way it worked is you couldn't use the same card in turn. So eventually you would have to use that card. So not only are you encouraged to help each other, you're forced to, even if you have those players who are trying to play selfish. And I really like that. And we also talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles games from IDW and with the sharing dice system in that. I love that for cooperative games. Right. Uh, a couple more suggestions from Ryan. He wonders if uh, One Deck Dungeon com comes in as challenging. Uh, the problem, I thought it didn't seem epic to me. It seemed too short. That's right. why I did not put it on the list. Again, I haven't played it, but doing the research today, I did look at a number of solo games, and that one I did not put. Like, I literally I just start typing one deck, and it shows up. Because I was trying to see how long it was, and I'm like, oh, it's 45 minutes. But, like, that's a quick filler game to me. And unless, like, you want to play hundreds of games over a year, <laughs> that like, to me, that just seemed now challenging. I don't know. Maybe it's really hard to win that 45-minute game. Right. I don't know the game that well, but the complexity rating on this was lower. Um, it did win the 2016 Golden Geek Best Solo Board Game. Or sorry, nominated. Nominated. Uh, so definitely a solid fantasy game. Maybe it should have been on the list. Just didn't seem epic enough. Like like less than half an hour a game just seemed kind of like filler. But then I threw on Castle Panic. So I guess I probably should have one deck dungeon on the list. So my bad. If I'm going to put on Castle Panic, this should have been on the list. Uh, the next thing is he was wondering about Dice Throne Adventures. And now this does. Dice Throne itself is not a single player say, game. Dice but not. Dice Throne Adventures, okay. the expansion for it, makes it a uh, guess, best came, at one to two. Came out in the last year. 19, or 2020. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a pandemic. Sorry. A little too new hotness for us. A little too new hotness for us. But uh, so, yeah. That's was something worth looking at, possibly, is Dice Throne with the Dice Throne Adventures expansion fair enough good ratings really good ratings yeah no absolutely and wow uh, oh, 900 ratings and it's got an 8.5 so uh some uh, razzle was mentioning sleeping gods is a good game uh which has an odd 60 to 1200 minute playtime um <laughs> i'm not sure if that's a typo or if that's a that really a long game, game. That, that was a recent kickstarter is that even in people's hands yet ah uh, that i can't that I can't say. It's it is It is another seventh continent, or <laughs> um, what do you call it? You're lost on a ship, and you're exploring. What's with these 1920s? You're lost somewhere, and you have to explore. It's a campaign game. You play as long as you want. When you're ready to take a break, you mark your progress in your journal, making it easier to enter the, to the game. Uh, so, yeah, this is another... another um, like I said, reminds me of Seventh Continent. Reminds me of Robinson Crusoe a bit. Looks epic, but I didn't know it was out. Hit stores early July. Oh, so last Very month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're talking about games from nineteen. <laughs> from, yeah, we're, from we're talking about nine-year-old games here. Um, there aren't. Uh, oh, it's Red Raven though. Okay, now I'm interested. <laughs> that that that's Ryan Lockett. Is Ryan Lockett designed it? Yeah, Ryan Lockett designed it. So that's like the designer of near near and far, above and below, Charterstone. Probably awesome. So yes, probably belongs on the list. <laughs> I use a spiral book. It looks really cool. 1920 steamships, though. Razzle says, 502 says, it's worth looking into. Trust me. Yeah, no, it looks good. There we go. 1920. So just like side. Yeah, um, exactly. What's with the roaring 20s in board games? We're going to be able to do a, like the best board game set in 1920s. There you go. It's weird. Uh, it's a, no one's noticed this. Everyone noticed Mars and Zombies. 
anyone notice there's a ridiculous number of games coming out set in the 1920s well it is the 2020s i mean it's 100 years so not oh yeah maybe really. that's it maybe that's it's, it's 100 just, years ago where everyone wants the everyone wants the 2020s to be the roaring 20s again um so we can get lost because <laughs> that's and <laughs> have mechs we want our steampunk um that's about all we've got going on all right. for right now there